So okay, right now, so what you're what you're looking at is we're actually in the what's called the femoral artery, which is the uh, artery in the groin on the left side. Um, we have the what's called the RCM here, uh, which controls the robotic catheter. There are two cartridges that attach on either end here. One controls uh, the uh, what's called the leader, which is the the finer of the two catheters, which telescopes through the sheath, which is controlled by this other cartridge. And the cartridge essentially have four wires that permit uh, flexion, actually six degrees of freedom. Um, because they are long catheters, you need some control in terms of the, uh, the buckling. And so there is this large accordion-like device, which is called the anti-buckling device. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. And uh, that, that permits a more glide transition uh, into, the, uh, into the artery, into the, into the sheath that, that is basically right here in the groin. Um, the other component that you may be able to see up here is the guide wire manipulator. So generally, when we manipulate a wire, we do so with our fingers or something that's called a torque device, which allows us to hold a little plastic device that locks onto the wire. Well, this does that for us. There are essentially two uh, belts that will glide, guide the wire both forward and backwards and also rotate it. So the two plates kind of uh, transition across each other. Um, and that's the, the bulk of the robot, actually. Am I missing anything? No. No, the handsome people are nodding. No, there's nothing I'm missing. All right. Um, so there, there are two ways of guiding the, uh, the system. There is over here, which you actually don't really see. Um, Kim, if you just uh, shift over just a tab. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So this is a bedside pendant. And everything that you can do here you can actually do at the console where we're going to be guiding the, uh, the catheter from, which is remote uh, to the patient and allows us to be out of the uh, x-ray field, gives us a little bit of protection from all the radiation we get every day. Very good. Alan. So why don't you keep working, and I'll talk a little bit about yeah. the room that you're working out of. So this is what's okay. called a hybrid room. Now, hybrid, what does that mean? Uh, traditionally, up until probably four or five years ago, imaging was done in a cardiac catheterization laboratory, and surgery was done in an operating room. And so what's exciting, and they're just panning around this room, is that what is happening is these things have converged. Now these imaging systems are being put in what we've traditionally called operating rooms. And so it's referred to as a hybrid room. And what that allows us to do is extend our reach. It lets us change the way we do conventional surgery by using smaller incisions, more remotely, and yet working at long distances in an operation and a procedure that may require a surgical component, but it can now be markedly reduced the magnitude of the procedure that we're doing. And a lot of this is really about how do you control these devices. And this is kind of a futuristic way, really, of doing this at the moment. What you can see is... Uh, typically, we use x-ray guidance. Now, that means the operator could be standing four or five hours a day next to a radiation-producing machine. And there are increasing concerns about the amount of radiation exposure our nursing staff is getting, huge changes in their way of practice, for example, if the nurse becomes pregnant in terms of how they can interact with these machines. Uh, but increasingly, as physicians, we're doing longer and longer and longer procedures and more and more and more uh, radiation exposure. So this is one of the environments that's very similar to what NASA is dealing with. And we know, actually, he's not shown this, but we have real-time radiation monitors. In the past, we used to have a little x-ray badge. And at the end of the month, we'd turn that x-ray badge in. It would be developed. And the uh, x-ray physicist, the radiation physicist, would come back and say, Dr. Lumsden, you got too much radiation uh, last month. Or maybe even two months ago. You have no idea what to do about it. And so now what we have is real-time radiation sensors that we step on this pedal and we see immediately how much radiation we're getting. And that changes your behavior very dramatically. We know that uh, radiation exposure is a function basically of distance. And when you see uh, your radiation count going red line, nothing uh, entices you to move back and move out of that radiation field or bring in some lead. And so the very fact that you can move the operator out of the radiation field is of some advantage. And so what you're looking at now is, is an x-ray. We're looking at the patient's pelvis. And what we're looking at here is an overlay. This is actually an image that has been imported and fused on top of this patient. So we're working off an image that could be acquired remotely and fused on top of the patient. 
And what John is doing at that console is controlling this catheter. So typically what we use is a wire, and this is called the leader catheter, and this is called the sheath. And all of these three things can now be controlled independently inside the imaging system. Now, what is upstairs in Mighty, we didn't take you up there this year, we've always taken you previous years, what is being installed right now, we'll be up and running by the end of this month, is a joint uh, venture with Siemens where we are integrating the robotics with the robotic control system. We think, and this is where NASA comes in, because it's all about trajectory planning. That if we take a 3D image, and we can actually line up what the trajectory is for that catheter, then can we semi-automate catheter movement inside these Barbara, vessels, Marie, and the ideally down? not touch the walls? Go ahead, John. More of the groin. Yeah. So we've actually gotten now the leader and the uh, sheath all the way down the groin. And uh, Marie is actually going to correct that a little bit. Come off the overlay, please. So this is the overlay that he was using. And you can see one of the challenges, as soon as you move the patient, you may lose this. Now, there are mechanisms by which we can fuse these together so the overlay moves with the patient whenever we move them. One of the challenges is respiratory motion, cardiac motion. It's a real problem in the heart because the heart beats. We prefer everything to stay exactly the same. Of course, that's not realistic. Shoot through the, uh, sh the, the leader, please. So this is that antibuckle. So Alan, yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to shoot some dye to see where the, uh, uh, the artery down to the knee, the superficial femoral artery, is coming off. And uh, Marie is actually going to shoot some contrast. She's going to take the wire out first, shoot some contrast through the leader. And that'll give us that map that we want in order to get that into, the, uh, into that SFA. Thank you. So one of the Marie, most common area can, that you get blockage in the arteries in the lower extremity is at the, a little bit further down we're seeing at the moment uh, in the femoral artery. And this is the control system that John is, lo is looking at. Now panning back around at the table. And so what he has uh, going to do is inject dye. And dye so that we can actually visualize the inside. Imagine we're working inside the well bore. We're looking at what we call a luminogram, the inside of the blood vessel. And you're showing an outline of the narrowed areas or the blocked areas that are present. So what he's doing now is, is making the field smaller so we get less radiation exposure and actually improves the quality of the image. You can see in the background the silhouette of these blood vessels. That's because blood vessels get calcified. And sometimes there's so much calcium, they're almost like bones, that we can actually see these, much like you can see the bones here, you can see the outline of the blood vessels. So decalcification, Bill, is a big issue. And it was what was being talked about. My, Marla, Marty talked ready? about one of the new concepts is using ultrasound to fragment the calcium to make it easier for us to open up these arteries. DSA. Okay, so All right. what you're Come looking at here uh, is further, please. main femoral artery the, in the groin. The knee. This is called the profunda femoris artery. One of the challenges we have is we get build up in select areas of the yeah, vascular. But it doesn't happen yeah. diffusely. It happens in very specific areas. It happens in your coronaries. happens in, yeah. this is called the superficial femoral artery. Go AP, though. And that should be one continuous tube that goes all the way down here. Oh, no, AP. So what he's going to do is re-inject this to see where the, how far down the blockage extends. Then you've got to make a decision about whether this is something we can open with a catheter or we have to go ahead and do a bypass on it at some point in time. So he's going to inject more dye. You'll see all the little collaterals come down the well and then fill basically the obstruction down some more. Uh, distal to your blockage down there, Bill. Mm -hmm. Okay, now center it up. That's the knee. Good. That's the patella. Typically, yep. this is where the blockage in these Ready? arteries actually occurs. And it usually opens up right down in this area. Too hard, huh? <laughs> so these are the little collaterals that are coming down. See? See how it opens up? This is the blockage. It keeps the distal part open because all these little branches that are going to come down here. And so before we can do anything, we got to connect those dots, ideally with that wire. And that wire will tend to go down all the little open branches. What you really want to be able to do is hold it steady and drive that wire. We want to bore right through the middle of that hole, Bill, and get our wire down to the other end. Once we've done that, then we can take whatever device, be it a drill, be it a catheter that chops out, clot, you know, we can drive it down over that and open up that tube. 
And so opening up the tube is one component of this. What Marty Leon was alluding to is keeping it open as a whole different ball game. And that's really where this combined mechanical put stents in there, open them up, combined with a long-term biological influence, the delivering medications or drugs into the high-risk area to try and prevent cell proliferation. That's really the strategy of drug eluding stents. Oops. So this is the femoral artery, blocked, will reopen down here. And this is a spared circulation. Again, we don't really know why that vessel was spared. Uh, but this is very typical what you, what you find. This is why somebody who has that kind of blockage doesn't have gangrene of the leg. Because when this develops slowly over time, there are ways really of, you have intrinsic ways of opening up, we call them collaterals, these alternate circuits, and delivering blood into the distal part of, the, uh, the, of your leg. So again, what he's doing now is using this overlay as a roadmap uh, to actually guide the catheter. He'll drive that catheter and that wire down here. Okay, that's fine. Just leave it and there. That's kind of where the rubber hits the road. If we can't get a wire through this, we're done in terms of being able to do this with a catheter. All right. Tell me. Let me know when your when your belt is closed and we're ready to go. Thank you. So in order to inject the dye, he had to take that wire out. So the, because there's a little hole, 3,500th of an inch channel is what he's in, injecting dye down through so we can see it. So we're back to watching John. And the interesting thing is this catheter control system, we can either do it with buttons or this is a three-dimensional mouse, which, uh, you know, very, different operators prefer to use a mouse in 3D or to use these buttons. And so these buttons that you can see on this hand are the way that he's going to actually control this. So what they're doing is doing what's called remasking it. Take that image, save the image he wants to navigate, and then overlay it back on top of the blood vessels. Thank you. Come down a little there bit on that. So he's fading it down Thank a little you. bit so we can see it. And then he's going to start bringing that wire forward, and he'll probably use that robotic catheter to steer it down here. There you go. So he's bringing the catheter up close to give it a lot of stability. And then he'll bend it a little bit and use that to push the wire uh, down. There you go. Wrong artery. So now you can see Jean, this is how he's controlling the whole thing. Actually, he's using two hands to control it. And Jean's probably one of the most experienced people in the world using this. Uh, he was involved in helping develop this catheter. This was, the catheter was originally designed for use inside the heart uh, for ablating nerves, but that's a huge device we, uh, because it was in through the vein. Uh, this was actually specifically designed for going in through arteries, so it's much smaller diameter, and it's got much more flexibility. And future designs will be even smaller, and even more controllable. Can you push us back up to the floor? Yeah, there you go. So see, they, they've already got it down here. So you, you lead with the wire, follow with these catheters, and now he's going to try and push that wire right through that obstruction, that blockage. That probably is going down a little side branch. We'll see. There you go. So it's somewhat like pattern recognition. So anytime we see that, it's probably going to sit through a little branch. And you'll bring this catheter down and follow up on this to hold the position and then continue to advance it. Mm -hmm. now, one of the prototypes of these devices actually had ultrasound built into the tip of this. So not only can we see longitudinally, we can also see cross-sanctionally so that we can make sure that we're still in the middle of the tube, that we're not getting out of the tube. One of the challenges is that 
what you, we can't do in this device is inject dye at the same time as we're doing this because we're using all three of these uh, devices together. And when you see a bend in the wire like that, mm, makes you worry a little bit. Looking better though. So we sometimes call these aha moments. Aha, probably shouldn't do that one again. <laughs> So see how easily the catheter follows the wire? Uh, that's not something that's that easy to do. And so what he's going to do you know, is to check that at the end of this point. catheter no, the, is the, where the, we the think it is, we and inside the blood vessel. So he's moving on down to the bottom end of that blockage. That's what his target is. That was the old image. And so we can kind of do what's called remasking this on the patient, overlay this again. Mm -hmm. So this is not new dye, this is old dye. This is an old image that will be fused on top of the patient, kind of like you saw outside with the, with the translucent imaging system. So these are about 90 centimeters long, unlike 7,000 feet long that you, you're, you're dealing with, Bill. Mm -hmm. Now. Thank you. So, we always watch where the end of the wire is, and so it should, it should be coming down here. He's going to inject a little dye to see um, exactly where this is in relation to the end of the blockage. And the nice thing about these catheter-based procedures is it usually does no harm. Um, when we, surgery is a big deal down here, it kind of lays patients up for a period of time, the leg is swollen. Here, when you bring these wires down here, even if you perforate the artery, usually doesn't make any difference. It's something, you know, it's a failed procedure, but doesn't really harm the patient. So what he's worried about is kind of that sinusoidal appearance. It's in the right general direction, but typically it makes you worry that it's in the wall of the artery rather than in the lumen of the artery. And actually that's one of the techniques for recanalizing these. So we like to go right down the middle if we can, but you can't see the middle of a blocked artery. And one of the thing, one of the challenges that we've got, maybe you can help us with this, is that we image patent to patent. What we can image is the blockage as we're going through it real time. And so that's one of the areas is that, uh, and then we can't really very easily control when we get to the end of it, how we get that catheter to come back in. We see the wire goes easily like that, usually means it's back inside the, uh, the lumen of the blood that vessel. Pretty good. Okay, do me a favor, take the wire out and shoot a shot, please. <laughs> Depends how brave you're feeling, John. <laughs> so this is called, well, this is know. the aha moment. It's about to happen here. <laughs> So it looks like the wire kind of took a natural path after a little while. Yeah, and I, did. So I agree. Mm -mm. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Marie, make sure you close that valve before you shoot. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to shoot some dye in there and just see if we're in the inside of the blood vessel or in the wall of the blood vessel. So you can see how the, the pictures ready? have been relayed from okay, the X-ray machine the onto this imaging so control console that's present. How's that? Much better, thank you. You ready? Okay. I'd call Hallelujah. That perfect, yeah. John's now breathing. So this is exactly what you wanna see. Okay, we know this is so-called back in the lumen of the artery. We've gone through this blockage, through the wall of the blockage, comes back in here. And this is what we see yeah, when we're in the right that. place. All these little branches come off. This comes down here, now, divides uh, into the arteries that are going down. So this is the hardest the, part the of the procedure, of the is making sure that wire comes across so that and making sure we're endoluminal at the bottom end of this. And now all sorts of options exist. We can we can angioplasty. Yeah, that's what I'm it. We can put a stent in it. REO, please. Uh, that doesn't really matter. All of the things that you heard about this morning. But crossing the lesion and getting back inside the, the lumen is the first step in being able to do this procedure. So what they're going to do now is just look at what we call the runoff. Again, it's all about resistance. What we're looking at is the blood vessels down the leg. Now what you, we're looking at here is the bottom end of that big open artery. 
And if they let it cycle for us, this is called the anterior tibial artery. It looks pretty good. A little bit of a narrowing here. Um, the other, there should be three arteries coming down here. So two out of three of them are blocked. Um, that's okay. It's basic, simple plumbing. You, plumbing. you better open up the upstream before you do the downstream. Isn't that right, Bill? And so what he's going to do is increase the head of pressure by opening that up. Probably will uh, not touch the these. Perineal. The only time we actually go down yeah, on these yeah. little blood vessels, if the patient is gangrene or a big oh, ulcer good. on the foot, that's fine. if Thank it's just you. a matter of trying to improve the blood supply, then all I'll do really is put a stent in here to try and open the, open this up. Much more out of doing that than, than not doing it, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, I think. And he's got actually an ulcer, so he needs flow. So the options then are okay. you put a balloon in there to open this up, long balloon very basic, blow the balloon up, reestablish some flow, and then make a decision about whether you're going to put a stent in there. Typically when you have right. long blockages like this, right, you're so usually uh, going to end up a, putting uh, a stent I'll in it, because it won't look very good from there. angioplasty alone. And one of the, uh, now the downside of a stent is the stents break. A, uh, you know that area of the leg, when people walk, that artery shortens and rotates. And so one of the big issues with stents in that area is stent fracture. And stent fracture drives failure of the artery. And so the whole modus operandi is to meet more flexible stents. Or what Marty mentioned this morning is a friend of mine, a guy called uh, Peter Schneider, was a surgeon in Hawaii who developed what he called that tacket, like little mini stents. So just pop, pop, pop. And they're not all connected. And they're flexible longitudinally to try and prevent you know, this kind of uh, late re and failure uh, from actually occurring. So, John, what are you thinking about doing? Uh, can you pitch a Mustang? Um, uh, give us a four by, like, two, is there a 220 or something? Give me a second. What he's talking about is the kind of balloon that he's going to use to dilate this up. So, John, you're going to go ahead and dilate it? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. Thank you. And what you're looking at here is really just going down into the foot. This is the foot. And this is the artery. We really like to see that. We like to see continuous flow coming down all the way down to the foot. That's the ankle joint that you're looking at here. So the way that these x-rays are shot is the, it's what's called digital subtraction angiography. It takes a picture, then we inject dye. In theory, the difference between the original picture and the next picture, the computer subtracts the original image from the secondary image. So it gives us really good pictures of the blood vessels uh, themselves. Yeah. It leaves that kind of silhouette of the bone in the background, so we, we have some idea of where we're at. Perfect. Well, let's get that. Yeah, that stiff wire, please. Yeah. This is Marie. Yeah. Marie is our first year vascular surgery fellow. So the way people get to this level is that she's done five years of general surgery, and now she does two years with us uh, training in, um, in vascular surgery. So what they're doing is going to put a different wire down there, and then they're going to bring the balloon in. You got the cheater and the uh, and the wire, please. So what you're looking at here is this is one of the most sophisticated imaging systems around. This is a, this is also a robot. This was designed by Siemens, came out of the the car assembly business. This is a huge mechanical robotic arm that sits in the corner and allows us to move this into whatever position that we need it. But you can see how close he is to the the radiation source is actually under the patient. And that's, uh, yeah, where, so put the wire's coming back down. See how fast it moves when we know that we're inside the lumen of that blood vessel. Uh, what? All righty. All right, so now we got to take the leader out. So, Alan, what we're going to do now is we're going to take the leader out because obviously yep. we can't feed any devices through that. Yep. So this is and the leader. the key, obviously, here is to maintain our wire position. Yep. This is, this is like, this. never lose your wingman. I remember that from Top Gun. Never lose the wire. Once you get the wire across the lead, you never want to lose that wire until the case is done. Because that, if you get in trouble, that's what can save you. If you ruptured an artery, you can put a balloon in there, you can control it, you can put a stand in there. So a lot of the focus, sometimes some of the yelling, is if the, uh, if the wire gets pulled back inadvertently, because you're doing these long exchanges kind of in the air uh, with these different devices that are present. But, so that's the key. <clears throat> And guide wire technology is a whole technology really in its own right. You really want a, a long wire. Some of these wires are 260 centimeters long. That when we manipulate one end of it, it accurately translates that motion into the, into the bottom end of it. That's what the robot does probably better than anything, actually. 
Yeah, and what we have to calculate, so these machines count the amount of radiation this patient is getting. The, uh, All of that has to be stored in these patients. Uh, radiation burns in patients are very uncommon, uh, but they can happen, particularly with some long, sophisticated uh, procedures. If you have the radiation source in one angle, so if you move it around, less likely to get it. It is a sentinel event for us. That means it has to be reported federally. It's up there with... Um, Rape in a hospital, believe it or not, and this is actually, uh, these are called sentinel events that can occur in a hospital. Neonatal death, maternal death, or things like that are all up there and have to be reported. So the amount of radiation this patient is getting is very important to us. One of the real concerns is that people move between organizations and there is no way of tracking total radiation exposure for a patient who's being seen in three different hospitals for three different kinds of diagnoses. Say what? Laura? So what you're going to see is this. What we work off is radiopaque markers. And we, these, mar these little pieces of metal are put at either end of a balloon or a stand so we can actually uh, see them uh, yeah. under the x-ray system. And that's really uh, what, what he's going to show you next. So what we'll do is we'll watch the balloon going up. Then he's going to inject some dye. It'll be open, but it'll be kind of irregular. And he'll follow that up with the stent, take the robot out and put the stent in at that point in time. And then we can cut away to go to the next presentation. How you doing, John? What the hell, man? Doing all right. Here's oh, the balloon you, you see at the top yeah. there. So that's the, that's the radio peak marker on the end of the balloon. See how that shaft is a little bit thicker than the wire? That's the bottom end of where that balloon is. So they're bringing this up. They chose a, a long balloon to cover the entire length of this blockage. And then what they'll do is generate about uh, 14, 15 millimeters of mercury pressure. This, is, is, this balloon is filled with a combination of saline and dye that lets us see the balloon when it blows up. So I remember, Bill, you showed um, how you guys inflate quarter-inch steel tubing underground and had a pumping truck that generated a million pounds per square inch of pressure. And one of the presenters said, aha, we need higher pressure balloons. Is that what you're suggesting? So here's the balloon going up oh, along the whole length of the artery. Now, things that we are concerned about is that artery is full of stuff. We prefer that stuff not sweet downstream. Uh, there are newer methods of actually putting filters down below it so we can catch any of that stuff. It actually happens fairly uncommonly. And one of the ways you get around it is prolonged inflation pressure. Blow this thing up, leave it for a period of time, uh, usually about 30 seconds to a minute, we're going to leave this inflated, then he's going to take it down, and he's going to re-inject dye to see if it's open. So you're creating the pathway that you can then come in with your next intervention. Okay, come on down. When the balloon's coming, this is what you're looking at is dye, iodinated dye inside the balloon. That's what lets us see the picture. And then you always make sure the balloon is down before you go taking the balloon out. I'll cut the damn catheter. That's another reason for yelling and screaming in the operating room. Okay. Floor, let's see if it's all down. Okie dokie. So you're going to leave the wire in. You're going to take this balloon catheter all the way back out. Or you may opt to reinflate it one more time. Anyone got any questions while he's doing this? Okay. Yeah, David. Go ahead, I got the fire. All right. So the, so the question is, is there a right, device that you can yeah. put in and kind of inflate it at the bottom end and scrape uh, some of this stuff out? Not quite. So you see the audio is now open, okay? It doesn't, again, doesn't look too pretty because of this stuff here. Um, and this is a situation, what you're talking about, David, is debulking. So one of the concepts is, what all we've done is squash and dilate the artery. The other, other method is by which we can go in and actually cut out some of the stuff that's in there. So the answer to that is, yeah, there are a whole bunch of different devices designed to do this. And as usual, when there's a whole bunch of different devices, none of them work very well in terms of being able to do this. And so I'd say that went about many as well of those have come and gone. Most of it kind of goes well back to finish. really looking at this. Stenting and balloon angioplasty does rem remarkably well. And so he's got the audio open. He now has the option of a variety of different things. He may even opt to stop and do nothing at this point. This will really make a dramatic difference to this patient's walking ability. 
Any other questions? Well, I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to go ahead and stent. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. We're, we're, we're just talking. It, yeah. Well, sure. bizarre. Yeah. These stents are extremely sticky in terms of their. Yeah. Delivery. So, so right now, uh, the raw. So this is the first generation, basically, of these peripheral robots, uh, and it's the first time we've ever had this kind of control. So typically, probably right. Yeah. Well, when there's an assistant who's used this a lot, they they would do a lot of this table side. So the, the the operator doesn't need to come backwards and forwards the whole time. We typically use this where we have failed other procedures. We, we've tried the traditional way and failed with it. And we've had some dramatic successes where we've tried multiple times, couldn't do it. We bring in the robot, we bring in the 3D imaging, and we have managed to complete those cases. And some of these stents now have drugs placed on top of them that actually came from the cancer world. The drugs that we're loading onto this, same drugs that the oncologists were using for treating ovarian cancer. And you can put small so quantities Alan, of drugs. This is exactly this is a this is a drug eluding stent here. Okay. Mm. So this is a silver the, stent. This the is the first PTX. one that's ever been approved in the United States. Um, it has paclitaxel, comes from the dew tree, um, and has actually been used in um, uh, treatment of ovarian. This is the one that's used in treatment of ovarian cancer. So what it does is it arrests cell proliferation. So it stops those cells that cause renarrowing from proliferating and narrowing the artery. But, okay. it's kind of what Marty was talking about earlier. Five, four, it doesn't just target the bad cells, it targets all cells. So it stops the artery from healing. And so that was one of the reasons that stent occlusions, thromboses were occurring yeah. in the coronary yeah. circulation. The patient comes in needs another kind of surgery, they stop some of the anticoagulants and the stent would block off because the stent hadn't healed the same way that other stents had. So he's putting in the second stent. You almost have to overlap these things just a little bit. That's also and a risk area. Whatever we overlap stents, that, that's a, a slightly increased area where a risk of fracture and renarrowing. And what he's doing is he's got a handle, and he's going to pull back the handle, and it's going to deploy the stent. You'll see this one starting to deploy. I'll, I'll, I'll do this for you. Living life dangerously here. <laughs> yeah, so the whole thing's coming back. So advanced. Hey, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if the patient's awake. <laughs> it's not usually something you say if the patient's awake. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what you, you know, we want stability of the stent. We don't want it migrating forward. So they're they're pinning this. That little see that little marker is going to retract back, back and that stent is going to fan out inside the other one. There, there you go. go. We can pull back, pull back. See, see there's overlap back. areas right there. All right, that's fine. Go ahead. And there's the stent. Second stent has been deployed. All right, there you go. All right, so you can see that's actually where we dissect it in. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. And then what you do is you post-dilate this. You bring another balloon back inside, and you just kind of even it out so it's not all crinkled up in, inside the artery. And this will look perfect, and we'll, uh, my prediction. <laughs> um, the issue is down the line. But these are, this is the newest technology. It will deliver drug into the wall of the artery. So what it does is it delivers high concentration drug exactly where we want it okay, without the deleterious effects of this running around your systemic circulation. So when we're going to treat ovarian cancer, we fuse this systemically, your hair falls out, you feel generally pretty bad. Here, it's targeted therapy, delivering the drug exactly where we need it. So maybe your pipelines where areas of low shear could be drug-eluting microbial antibiotic releasing stents in the area of low shear where the microbial induced corrosion So let's there. get that last one. Seven. Yeah. So, Alan, I'm going to put one last stent in, yep. and then uh, I think we'll be done. We'll, we'll, we'll post-dilate uh, the whole thing. That looks great. And then uh, if you guys want to want to break away, I may actually yep. go down and treat uh, the tibial a little bit. Okay. All right, John, thank you very much indeed. It looks great. Appreciate it very much. <laughs>